Welcome to this webinar on Corpus Linguistics Tools and Language Acquisition Research. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Nearly 60 people have signed up. We're delighted that you're with us uh, as part of this concluding event in this academic year's uh, series convened by CALM, the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute and CALM as one of the research centers of the Moore Institute. It's uh, directed by John Walsh, uh, Dr. John Walsh, and by Professor Laura McLaughlin. And I want to thank them for all of their work this year. It's been fantastic to get, get the series going and to see remarkable audiences for, for, for wide-ranging discussions. Uh, Laura is uh, chairing tonight, and I'm going to turn over to her now to introduce our speaker, Professor Anna Bachowska. Laura. Thank you, Dan, and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar, which is uh, the last one uh, of the series for this um, current academic year. And I'm very happy to introduce Professor, Professor Anna Bonczkowska, who joins us from Poland, from the University of Gdansk. Uh, Professor Bonczkowska is um, an expert in linguistics and, uh, and applied linguistics. She graduated in English philology at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan and then received a PhD and habilitation in uh, English linguistics from the University of Łódź. She specializes in corpus linguistics, tools and methods, which she applies to translation studies, language learning and acquisition, cognitive linguistics and discourse analysis, from uh, migration discourse to medical discourse to media discourse and uh, social media. She's also currently involved in two EU projects on uh, crowdsourcing in language teaching and another one on uh, impoliteness in uh, discourse analysis and uh, linguistic linked data. She's authored um, over 60 papers, uh, one monograph. She's edited three volumes on translation and media discourse. She's also been um, acting as journal editor. She's a journal associate editor and also advisory uh, board member, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> And tonight she will talk about corpus linguistics tools in language acquisition research. So we will hear about the child's database, which is a, a repository of transcripts or conversations held among um, adults and children. And Professor Bonchkowska will discuss data showing developmental changes occurring in language acquisition in monolingual and uh, bilingual children. So as always, during our webinars, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, you can write your uh, questions in the Q&A box here in Zoom or on Facebook if you are following us live on uh, social media. And uh, my colleague then, Dr. John Walsh, will coordinate the discussion at the end. So over to you, Anna, and thank you and welcome. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure and honor for me to have this wonderful opportunity of sharing with you, uh, with all the participants, uh, sharing my the results of my research. And also thank you very much for this uh, very nice um, introduction, very nice presentation of what I'm doing. Um, so, um, okay, I think that uh, it's uh, time to start. Um, because I have only 30 minutes. So uh, I'm going to share the screen and hopefully you will see it in a moment. Um, if you could just anybody confirm, perhaps Laura, if you could confirm that you can see. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So as, as uh, Professor McLaughlin has already mentioned, uh, the title of my uh, presentation is Corpus Linguistics uh, Tools in Language Acquisition Research. Uh, of course, corpus linguistics um, can be used in a, a number of different areas, uh, and I'm going to focus only on language acquisition um, in our meeting today. Um, so, uh, Childs, uh, Childs is the uh, language data database, so which, uh, which is a repository of um, uh, interaction, verbal and nonverbal interaction as well, of uh, basically it, it, um, of first language. Uh, so basically it uh, mirrors the first language acquisition. Uh, there are both audio and video recordings available there, which are usually uh, placed in a natural setting. And of course there are transcripts, uh, not all um, transcripts are, are um, uh, have also video 
uh, or audio options. Nevertheless, uh, the transcripts are there. Um, okay, just a moment. So, Dutch. Okay, so uh, basically, there are twenty six languages, so it's a relatively relatively huge in fact a database um, uh, within that um, uh, there are smaller like sub data bases like subcorpora and there are uh, 130 of them and uh, the whole idea was uh, initiated by professor brian McQueenie and initiated in the 80s although the very texts were already uh, the transcripts were prepared and they were introduced to um, uh, to the, the database uh, uh, much earlier. I mean, they were introduced to the database, of course, when it was uh, launched, but um, they were, um, transcripts were created all as uh, long ago as the 60s, in fact. Um, currently, it is a part of uh, another database, which is called a uh, slightly bigger, which is called a talk bank corpus. Um, which is uh, uh, also includes conversational, different types of conversation, uh, um, conversations, as well as uh, some clinical data uh, databases, and also um, uh, also transcripts of second language acquisition. It is free, publicly available. Um, and uh, you can use it on your own. So this is the address, the current address where you can find it. Um, if you go there, you have to choose the browsable data bases, and then you go to child. Uh, to, as you can see, there are many different languages available. Uh, Polish is also there, it's just not visible in this uh, fragment. And then if you choose a British, uh, let's say British English, uh, then you have another um, uh, another option to choose uh, uh, several different databases created by a number of people. As you can see, within each of these databases, there are there is usually more than one child. There are usually, in fact, quite a number of uh, children recorded, and the children are um, traced as they develop. So, for example, there are recordings when they were three, when they are four, or five, or seven, and so on. Um, okay, so once you choose uh, any of these transcripts, you can have access either to the tra transcript with the audio, audio or with the video and audio. Um, also, okay, uh, the video looks more or less like that. You can just uh, uh, watch it. Uh, it's usually quite long and you can see what's going on. Um, and uh, sometimes there is only transcript and these are the most common um, files, in fact, or only media, but uh, these are quite rare. So if you want to analyze charts, then you have to use a special program, which is called uh, CLAN, and it allows you to retrieve data from the database. However, CLAN is not that intuitive, I would say. I mean, it's not difficult to, to learn how to use it, but you have to go through the manual, probably, and you have to install it. So it's not... Um, it's not that smooth, I would say. Um, okay, you can install it using uh, for, for different types of uh, systems. Um, so once you get to uh, the database, uh, to a specific um, transcript, you have uh, metadata uh, displayed, um, displayed, and you, you know what kind of activity the child was involved, what is the language, of course, um, what is the file, and also, um, who is the child, you know, how old is the child, in this particular case, three years old, uh, a girl, and who else in, uh, was involved in the whole scene. And then you just can uh, watch uh, here or just read the transcript. As I said before, CLAN is not a very reliable tool, uh, it doesn't go smoothly when you use it, at least this is my experience I had from some time ago, which was really discouraging and I stopped analyzing the, the data simply. Um, but all of a sudden I discovered that in another database that I'm, uh, I, I, subscribe, uh, I subscribe, which is the Sketch Engine, it was uh, actually added to this database. So I was very pleased and I'm going to talk how to use the, child, the child's uh, database uh, using the tools available through the Sketch Engine. Well, the Sketch Engine is, uh, is actually a corpus management system. It contains a lot of different corpora, really a lot, for really a number of languages. Um, and more importantly, um, it has a number of tools which uh, allow you to do, to do much more than uh, in the case of CLAM. Uh, so apart from the 
uh, obvious tools that corpus linguistics has, like uh, looking for synonyms, um, automatic retrieval of synonyms, um, collocations, keywords, frequency list, dispersion plots. There are also other things which are more important. First of all, you can upload your own corpus, uh, whatever you are working on. You can also and uh, analyze your own corpus using the tools already available in the system. And the tools are not only uh, tools which help you uh, help retrieve certain, um, certain elements, but also uh, quite a lot of statistical analysis can be done <clears throat> on the platform. Um, okay, you can also create a corpus uh, through web crawling. So basically you can uh, gather some uh, texts from the web. Um, until 2022, uh, the Sketch Engine uh, company is a part of, I mean, they um, uh, enacted a project, an EU project called eLexis. And as a result, uh, universities can join the Sketch Engine for free because it's actually a commercial system. So now I enjoy having it completely for free. Uh, after nine years of using it uh, on commercial, um, commercially. And I have checked actually in Ireland, your University of Ireland in Galway also has access to it. So you can, uh, I, su I suppose you can find it and use it uh, freely. So what is the structure of the child's corpus? <clears throat> um, you can see that the, there are several sub corpora divided according to the criterion of age. Uh, the percentage of the contribution of each age um, category, age group, is different. Uh, this one is probably what we are not interested in because, I mean, people over 18 are not really children. So of all these uh, groups, it is between zero and three that uh, contains most texts. Others are not so rich, uh, perhaps also four and six. So up to the age of six, there's quite a lot of data. Later on, uh, not, so not so many uh, files. So, well, it might affect the reliability of the results you achieve. Okay, so once you once you go to the sketch engine, you have also the uh, different tags that the corpus was tagged for sex, for text type, for language participant, role, age group, and so on. So you can choose whichever you want, and you do not have to search through the whole corpus, but just a part of it. So, for example, I chose sometimes only the group up to three, uh, between four and six, and so on. And then you can analyze actually how the language changes over the years. Um, the corpus, I didn't choose any particular corpus uh, because um, I wanted to have a more global picture, like a bird's eye view on how language is acquired generally, not in a particular subcorpora. And participation role, I always chose uh, the child because I was only interested in the language of the child. However, it might be also interesting to have a look at how adults talk to children. Okay, so I use the corpus query system, which is one of the system, one of the systems which is used in uh, to browse through a language corpora. The other one is, uh, um, in a way, uh, built in the British National Corpus, the Web Edition. I think it was about 2011 when it was introduced, and it's called Corpus Query Processor. It was used by Hardy, Hoffman, and Evers, and many other people. I'm using Corpus Query Language, which is built in the Sketch Engine. And I use it quite often, uh, uh, for example, um, in a paper on complement, complement retrieval from a corpus that I created or forms of address and so on. Uh, okay, this is based on M MTAS, which is multi-tier annotation search. I mean, the, the, the uh, languages are for, corpus, uh, for querying a corpus. And what it means basically is that you can um, have a query which uh, limits your search to a number of uh, a number of um, elements within different levels. So you might ask the system to retrieve um, uh, a word which is uh, specified in terms of some morphosyntactic uh, features. Uh, uh, so for example, you might be very specific, basically. You might be as, as specific as that you want to retrieve only words which are in the third person singular and so on uh, in a particular um, function in a sentence. Uh, that uh, uh, multi-tier annotation search um, the system was um, launched uh, and invented basically by an institute, uh, uh, Mertens Institute from the Netherlands. 
And uh, okay, well, if you want to analyze the corpus using CQL, you need to go to the advanced options and then you have to click CQL. You have to click CQL. CQL is based on different uh, tags. So you specify your search using tags. You can see the tags uh, here. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, there are different tags in different corpora because it just depends on which tag I was used. Uh, so you always have to check it. And um, this is basically, this one is based on the pantry bank tag set. However, it was also modified slightly by the sketch engine people. And then you can, for example, look for all the words which are tagged as verbs, as nouns, or you can combine different uh, tags. For example, only verb B plus a verb in a passive voice. So obviously, if you're looking for passive voice, this is what you should insert. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk about the stages of development of a child by Piaget, because I understand you are all specialists in um, language acquisition. Just to show you that um, the subcorpora created in child do not really overlap the stages of cognitive development by Piaget. So this is what I wanted to um, um, underline. Okay, uh, a bit about uh, a child and uh, what is going on in the child's head. Uh, mental, the mental lexicon, so, um, well, actually it's very rich. I think it's quite impressive that at the age of four, a child understands, comprehends about 14,000 words, um, which means 10 days, 10 words per day are actually learned by a child at the age of two. I think this is really a lot. Um, so, then uh, a few things about morphosyntactic development, which um, uh, I will uh, mention. I will go back to these features uh, later on. Um, so, of course, I mean one of the first, the first stage, the first stage of language acquisition is when the child starts saying something. It's usually one or two words. Uh, then, at the age of two, we have noun phrases which are pre-modified, and I will show you some examples on that. At the age of 2.6, so two years and six months, multiple pre-modification takes place. So there might be more than one adjective before a noun or an adjective and something else. Post-modification is apparently more difficult for a child, so it comes uh, later. The models can and will at the age are quite at the age of two, uh, which I think is quite early. Um, the age of two and, and uh, three months. Past tense inflections, the, irregu the regular inflections are acquired. The irregular inflections, uh, interestingly, are acquired much earlier um, because uh, irregular verbs, I mean, because they are treated by a child just as, as a word, as a separate word. So um, it's only in the case of regular inflections in the past tense that the child consciously actually manipulates and thinks how to put things together uh, in order to create a word in a past tense with the application of some grammatical rule. Um, okay. Uh, at the auxiliary, uh, auxiliaries are appear at the age of two and three. Uh, apparently, inflections and all grammatical words are learned by the age of four and a half, and by the age of five, all in all cultures, I think it's interesting, the core adult grammar is already um, acquired. There's another thing we have to mention about lexical, about child development, namely uh, some uh, idea of uh, average or mean length of a sentence, which was originally uh, proposed by Nice in uh, the 20th. And uh, according to this uh, theory, um, a the, um, when there are five words in a sentence, this is called the transition period. So um, it's like anything that is before is like very incomplete and or, or quite often wrong. Uh, and when uh, there are between six and eight words in a sentence, then the sentences are usually complete sentences and there are not many mistakes because the child already knows grammar, as you know, at the age of five. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the theory. So I, I decided to retrieve some examples from the corpus, from all the corpora, uh, and only but only limited to what the child is saying. So at the age of three, for example, we have a, a verb and noun, it looks like that. I mean, there were obviously more examples, but I just cut it off uh, for demonstration purposes. So what you can see here is that there is a lot of vocalization. I'm quite surprised that they are actually treated like verbs because uh, it looks like this is a verb C. So I suppose the system treated this as a, a noun, which unfortunately uh, biased the final results uh, in the statistical uh, analysis. I will come back to that later. Nevertheless, there's a lot of vocalization. We have uh, like line 
10, 5, 10, 17, and so on, where there are only single words or maximally two words. Uh, there's, there's only present tense. What else you can observe here? Uh, there are no um, words in third uh, person singular. Uh, just a reminder, at the age of 2.3, a child learns past tense inflection. So perhaps I would expect here to see some past, uh, past uh, irregular um, past, um, past tense verbs, but I didn't notice them here. Okay, now we have for the same uh, query, verb plus noun, uh, but uh, another group of uh, of children, it's uh, between the age of four and six, and we can observe here some vocalizations again, but also repetitions, um, also repetitions, and uh, an interesting thing in line six I observed is uh, saying um, T instead of C, uh, that's tan tan, which uh, obviously means can can here, and this is an example of a substitution process known as fronting, where a back vowel, back, um, back consonant becomes alveolar. Uh, also, uh, the verb auxiliary B is missing, and there's only the present tense used. Uh, just to remind you, by the age of five, all, uh, apparently all grammar, adult grammar is acquired. I can't see it here. Uh, so maybe uh, the theorists uh, were too optimistic. Um, or it's just not uh, representative enough uh, to prove it. The progressive tense is acquired before perfect tenses. Yes, perfect tense is acquired at the age of 4.5. So obviously continuous should already be used in a correct way, but it's not. Modal verbs, as you remember, at the age of two, uh, the people here, the children here are at the age between four and six, and still they have problems with uh, pronouncing uh, can maybe it's a problem of pronunciation rather than uh, cognitive uh, abilities of uh, distinguishing of modal verbs. I don't know. It's hard to say. And the same query with children between six and nine, <clears throat> and we have no vocalizations here. So we have a jump, uh, uh, an obvious improvement. Past simple tense with irregular form, and just to remind you, two point three is the age when children know uh, past tense inflections. Okay, and uh, here we have uh, um, the, the same query with the uh, children between the age 10 and 12. And um, between 10 and 12. Um, okay, so just to, um, so obviously there, there are a bit more complex. Just to uh, summarize this part, uh, this is the example of children between the age zero and three. Um, you can see a lot of vocalizations. Now, quite a difference uh, is visible here, quite an improvement. And these are children between the age six and uh, four and six, here between uh, seven and eight, and here between um, 10 and 12. So you can see that in 10 and 12, there are quite a number of um, gerunds used, which is apparently uh, difficult for children to learn. And it's one of the, one of the, um, one of the um, most, one of the elements that is learned really late. Um, okay, we, you can see some uh, gerund here as well, but it's uh, only sporadic, whereas here it's more uh, common. Uh, you can also see some um, past, uh, I could, um, where is the past? There was somewhere here was a past tense, uh, went, I think, um, can't see it now, but uh, just a minute. Um, Oh, went here and made. So these are irregular verbs. Okay, in the past are obviously uh, here. Okay, another study was uh, of adjectives in a noun phrase. And uh, I specifically focused on noun phrases where there was a noun uh, pre-modified by two adjectives. Uh, so this is an example from a corpus of children at the age of zero and three. You can see that a lot of vocalizations, I don't know why they are treated here as adjectives. This is quite misleading. Um, so it's good to remember about that. Um, uh, the numbers in the brackets is the number of occurrences, but it's not very um, reliable number because as you remember, uh, the subcorpora are of really of different size. So what is more important is the standardization, standard, standardization of these numbers, uh, for example, per 1 million words. So these are more important uh, indications of uh, how many um, times a noun was preceded by two adjectives. And it looks more or less like that. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say there's a, like a huge curve of development here, but you have to remember that I suppose um, 
this line, this point should be much lower because obviously all the vocalizations were counted here. So if we, um, uh, if we exclude the vocalization examples, then I suppose this line would go really low, which is what we would expect from a child because a child learns in the first place nouns because uh, they are mo most important for a child just to indicate what he or she wants then verbs but adjectives are not that important so to speak i mean they are not like um, within the survival vocabulary um, okay i also counted verb noun uh, noun verb ratio um, because it's also an indication of language development and it looks like this so you can see that the older the child uh, the less uh, nouns it uses probably it does not necessarily mean that it uses only more verbs but also um, well, in this case, actually, we could say that it is a question uh, or that uh, it only supports the thesis I've just mentioned, that uh, a child learns words, initially uh, nouns, and only later verbs. And this is actually supported by this study. Lexical diversity, but only within nouns, looks like this, uh, which means that, and again, um, these are not occurrences here but uh, they are already the results of some mathematical calculations. And the calculation is very simple. It's simply uh, you uh, divide the number of nouns by the total number of all the words, and to be more specific, all the tokens within a specific corpus, like the corpus of this age, for example. So uh, this is uh, what it shows. So what we can learn from here is the, that um, quite a number of nouns are used when a child is uh, uh, is very young, and then probably other uh, words are also used, so the curve goes down. As for verbs, it looks like this. Um, so again, uh, the number of verbs uh, versus um, all, num all total number of words in a corpus goes down with age, at least in the case of this particular database that I'm using. As for adjectives, it uh, obviously goes up. I wouldn't count, I wouldn't really treat this uh, seriously because obviously as, you've, as you have seen in the concordances, all the vocalized um, vocalizations were counted as adjectives. So probably this curve is somewhere here. Uh, and if it is here, that means that the, the older the child, the more adjectives are used. I have no idea why at the age of 18 and more, a child all of a sudden stops using adjectives uh, maybe the database uh, of this particular age is not very reliable. But again, it proves the fact that we know from the theory of language acquisition, first language acquisition, that adjectives are learned later. Okay, uh, I also analyzed passive voice. Uh, this analysis was is not very telling, unfortunately. Uh, why? Because, um, because it counts here, the system counts here all the errors, and some of these are not really examples, are not really uh, exemplifications of passive voice, but something which is, I'm not sure what it uh, actually is, it's just an error. So for example, B, being, it's obviously it shows that the child is experimenting with some grammatical rules, but it doesn't really uh, show true passive voice um, examples. Uh, so if we, if we just look at the numbers, um, we have 26 uh, examples uh, at this uh, age um, group, four here, one here, and the older they are, they, they, no, actually this is one from the um, people B being, uh, this is used, uh, uh, taken from, retrieved from the group between seven and nine. Uh, again, in seven and nine, there is a mistake here. There's an error, I suppose, not a mistake. So it looks like passive voice is quite difficult to master for children. And uh, the other thing that I mentioned at the very beginning is that uh, development of child language is also, count, is also um, accounted for by resorting to uh, the index parameter known as average length of a sentence. So uh, for this purpose, uh, for demonstration purposes, I used um, a corpus by Slobin. Uh, children between the age zero to three. And I found a third, a six to three examples, so just a few here I displayed. If you want to find uh, sentences, you just have to use this the corpus query um, element. And then what you can see here is that ALS is one or two. That means 
or maybe three in some cases, but we have a repetition here. So this is treated like the whole sentence. Um, this is for, uh, with, for children, this indication one, two is for children between zero and three. So I think it's fine. Simply the uh, corpus retrieval analysis, um, corpus analysis um, supports the theoretical assumptions in this case. Uh, then we have also another example. Um, okay, this is another example of uh, sentences counted the system, whatever the system counts as a sentence, and this is usually between two, um, uh, two dots. Um, okay, so we have um, children between the age of four and six, and the L uh, ALS parameter is four and five, as you can see here. But sometimes it's also one, but I wouldn't really count year as, you know, as a sentence. Between seven and nine, again, from the Slobin uh, corpus, we have six and 10. You have quite nice sentences and they are, most of them are uh, almost or always uh, even uh, grammatically correct. So again, this uh, analysis of ALS supports the theoretical assumptions that were voiced by uh, NICE into, in 1925. Okay, so conclusions, I, I hope I'm, okay, <laughs> I didn't exceed the time. So conclusions, um, unfortunately, not all theoretical assumptions have been confirmed by the corpus data um, using the child's database. I'm not sure whether unfortunately was actually the right word to say, because maybe the theoretical assumptions were wrong simply, okay? We have uh, empirical data now, we have a, a corpora available, and we can um, analyze what is actually out there rather than just speculate what the child should say on the basis of, you know, single, uh, single children observations. Um, the uh, noun, um, the noun verb ratio and average length of a sentence, these two parameters were basically confirmed by the analysis. Lexical diversity needs further analysis, in particular uh, verbs and adjectives. Passive voice, we have insufficient data because in the age groups, uh, quite high age groups, there were no examples, which means probably that, I don't know, maybe the topics were different, or did not require the children to use passive voice. Um, so obviously uh, a lot depends on the situation here. Uh, so this needs a further analysis, perhaps using some other databases. Noun phrases with pre-modifying adjectives, up to two, also need further analysis because, uh, or perhaps a fine-grained analysis, uh, which excludes all the cases uh, that were counted by the system as adjectives, but shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have been counted, like vocalizations. Verbs and past inflections, um, in particular the regular verbs, they develop later than theoretically assumed, because theoretically it is the age of two and uh, two years and three months when the child should already uh, master uh, inflections, past uh, ir uh, regular inflections. But it turned out that there was still a lot of problems much later. Uh, and just um, um, generally speaking, corpus tools allow allow one to observe uh, phonological, lexical, morphosyntactic development of first language acquisition, both quantitative, quantitatively and quantitatively and qualitatively. However, we must remember about some limitations because not everything can be uh, that uh, neatly presented on the basis of uh, empirical data. A lot depends on how big the corpus is, how big the database is, and what is the structure of the whole corpus. Um, you remember from the first slide uh, that uh, the subcorpora are not equal in size. The contribution is much uh, higher of the number counted in the number of documents in the case of children between zero and six. And uh, there are not so many documents uh, above the age of six. Uh, so this must be taken into consideration because I'm pretty sure that it actually um, somehow um, might have biased the results. The other thing is that you can't download the corpora from the sketch engine uh, because of copyright. Um, and so it's a pity because then we could upload it to another external software programs which calculate uh, many more indices uh, connected with lexical density, uh, connected with uh, lexical development, basically, or syntactic development. So this is what you cannot do. Uh, the tagging uh, of the child is not always reliable. I think there are quite a number of mistakes there, so you always have to check things manually. 
uh, and double check them actually. What I have noticed is that um, when I uh, set the uh, query only for what the child said, uh, sometimes still in the concordances, I could see that it's not only the child, but also aunt, adult, <laughs> some other researcher, investigator were also involved. It didn't happen often, but it did happen in some cases. So again, it needs some manual uh, cleaning, so to speak, of the data that are retrieved, uh, like the raw retrieve after raw first retrieval. Um, I don't think the database is fully representative of child language because it is huge. It is probably the only one, especially as of this size, but you can't say, I'm pretty sure you can't generalize about, you know, the language of children as such. It has some limitations because due to the number of um, children observed. And uh, so again, we have to remember about this uh, limitation that it's not a completely reliable um, confirmation or verification of any kind of falsification of any kind of theory, it only contributes somehow to a general general um, discussion. But you can't say that because it's not in the corpus, it doesn't exist or something like, you know, it's not that black and white. Uh, tracing lexical and for syntactical development of a single child in a selected corpus should give a reliable should give reliable results. So what I think uh, the child corpus is good uh, for is the uh, analysis of any kind of development of um, a single child, uh, rather than um, uh, rather than a, a tracing the development of all the children. Um, okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, uh, please ask. Uh, thank you for your patience <laughs> for joining the presentation. Thank you very thank you much very indeed. Much. And this was, uh... Sorry, sorry, uh, John. Yes, I was just going to say hand over to John for uh, uh, the questions now. I know there are some. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anna, and thank you, Laura. And uh, Anna, if you would uh, maybe stop sharing the screen, please, that would be great. Then we mm -hmm. can uh, look at the questions. There's a number of questions here already. And uh, uh, for anybody who has additional questions, please uh, put them into your uh, into the Q&A function. We have a number of questions. First of all, just a comment from John McRae, who is a colleague and a member of this group. He says, for your info, NUI Galway is a member of the Alexis Consortium and contributes to Sketch Engine. And John has a question. Did you use a POS tagger trained on the child's corpus mm -hmm. or was it a tagger trained on a corpus of newspapers or similar? This may explain the issues with detecting part of speech correctly. Well, if you could uh, ask the question again, because uh, I didn't really train the system on anything, because what I used was um, uh, the tools already uh, available through the system, through the Sketch Engine, and uh, you don't have to train it. You just use whatever is available there. So I'm not sure know, about... Do we, do we want to let John in maybe to ask that question? Um, David, yes, can please. John put on his microphone perhaps? Or John, can you put on your microphone yourself? Yeah, do you hear okay. me? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I think my comment is I know Sketch Engine, they've, they've trained all of their taggers on um, adult corpora, like newspapers. Ah, uh, I see. So when you just take the default settings in Sketch Engine, it's not going to work very well. It, you know, it's like, you know, you're showing it child language. It doesn't really know how to cope with it because it assumes all everything in English is like a nicely formatted newspaper article. So it's right. going to make a lot of mistakes. So. Yeah, I mean, if you talk to the Sketch Engine team, and maybe you can help you see if they can find something that's more appropriate for that corpus. Mm. Uh. Yeah, okay, thanks for that. Yes, uh, very interesting. I didn't know that they trained it on uh, the news. <laughs> so obviously there will be mistakes, but you know, you can uh, counteract, you, you can simply manually clean the data you wish to analyze, but of course it takes more time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for this uh, okay. remark. That's great, many thanks. And a question from uh, Christina Apavaloe. Is there any more data collection being done to add to these corpora? Um, well, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, on the uh, child corpus, the child, child database uh, website, you can find probably a bit more uh, files. 
I suppose, because uh, this is a, an ongoing project. Anybody actually, by the way, anybody can contribute uh, with their own data. If you have a child or grandson uh, and you observe, um, transcribe what the child is saying, you can, using, of course, uh, following the guidelines, uh, you can contribute uh, with your own data. So uh, the data are added on a regular basis. I'm not sure whether they are uh, added uh, at the same time to the sketch engine, probably not. So um, the, if you're interested in more data, uh, please go to the original website. Okay, thanks very much for that question, Christina. Um, another question from Laura McLaughlin. And she, uh, Laura, who uh, uh, obviously is <laughs> chairing tonight, uh, wants to know, Anna, if you also analyzed bilingual children and if you noticed the consisting, consistent mixing of categories, for instance, adjectives from one language and verbs from another. No, I haven't analyzed uh, bilingual children, but I think it's a great idea to do it. <laughs> so maybe a future, maybe I will, you know, joint a uh, project in, in the future. I think it will be very interesting. Um, yes, I know so, that there are bilingual Polish English children there, so I could uh, easily, I could easily do that. Yes. But you're sure then that all of the children featured in this corpora were monolingual? Was that a criteria for selection, or what are, are is that just? No, no, no. There's, yeah, there are different subcorpora for or bilingual children, monolingual children. I mean, all the metadata and the description of who the child is are well described in the corpus, so uh, on the website. So you can just search for whoever you are interested in. Okay, but you haven't specifically analyzed bilingual children. No, I haven't bilingual children. No. Okay, so does anybody else want to ask any more questions? Anybody else in our audience? Any other? There's no other questions on my screen here. No open questions at the moment. Yes, from Ethan Irlin in Manute. How do you define acquisition or mastery of a particular structure? For instance, in terms of frequency of use, percentage of correct use versus incorrect use of each structure. Uh, this is a question which is uh, a very theoretical one, and it's actually based on the, I mean, the answer is only in the theory. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't define the words which I retrieved from the corpus. I didn't define them whether they are already acquired or not. I was not interested in uh, the, uh, this aspect so much, rather than... Um, I suppose if you encounter the examples which were used in a wrong way, I shouldn't probably say that this was all acquired. This is the acquired word. It was not acquired because it was used in, in um, not the way it should be uh, according to grammar rules. So um, basically I didn't really define uh, uh, the words, whether they were, I mean, I wasn't searching how many words of the ones that were retrieved were actually acquired or not. Um, so, I mean, all the um, theoretical assumptions that I presented in the first slides were simply, you know, they are all available in the books on language acquisition. And I don't think that, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't interested simply in the degree of mastery these words. I was interested in the degree of occurrences in a corpus. So it was more like a statistical analysis rather than an analysis of what is going on in a, uh, or in the mind of a particular child. Do you mind if I just uh, stop for one minute because I would like to switch the light on. No I can problem. see that Go ahead. you can't see it's, me it's actually. Getting, no, it's getting yes. darker and darker for you. Yes, so please do I'll be just light, in absolutely. 10 yeah. seconds. <laughs> okay, that's great. So would anybody else like to come in then and ask any more questions before uh, Anna comes back? Any other questions from the audience? I don't know, David, if any questions have come in on Facebook. I don't see anything coming up here. Um, it looks like that might be. Okay. The, no, no questions. Okay. Uh, there's no questions yes. on Facebook, Anna. And you're now lit up again, but it looks like that we've come to the end of the questions uh, from the audience. So mm -hmm. um, if nobody else is coming in now, I would just like to thank Anna Bochkowska from the University of Dansk in Poland. Uh, for joining us for our final CAM seminar of the series for 2020 to 2021. And thank you all for your loyalty and for 
turning up for each monthly session and we'll be back in September for another series of exciting lectures on applied linguistics and multilingualism and all of the lectures from the current uh, CAM series are available at the YouTube link that David Kelly has finally has kindly uh, shared with us now and we'll make those available on our own website in uh, the future. So I'd like to thank uh, Laura McLaughlin for chairing this evening. I'd also like to thank uh, David Kelly of the Moore Institute for his technical support and also to Dan Carey, director of the Moore Institute for supporting us with this series. And thanks to all of you and especially to Anna for turning up. So uh, I you wish you all again. a pleasant Good evening watching. and uh, I don't know if it's a fine evening in Poland this evening, Anna. It's a beautiful evening here in Galway. So hopefully we can all enjoy some of the rest of the sun now. So okay. thank you all very much for Thanks coming. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks for coming and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.